Candy? Yes, sir. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm here. Who, who's this? Crystal. Crystal, what's going on with you? So far, I um I had surgery for cervical cancer a few years ago, and I got kind of weak while at work. So I'm back in the hospital while they run some tests. Oh boy, well I'm sorry to hear that. And so far, they're they're doing pretty good. She just wanted to make sure because I lost a bit of weight that everything was okay. So they haven't found anything that leads me to be scared. So she has my um date to be released back on Friday. She just wanted to make sure they went through all the necessary steps because I was stage three, one step away from full-blown cancer in 2011, and everything was fine, but recently my um, thigh had been hurting, so I wanted to let them know. Well, that's certainly good news. Definitely. I was very worried. But I am here. My mom was like, you're a trooper. I was like, yeah. I was trying to get my schoolwork in. My fiance won't bring my laptop, but I was like, I have my phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're pretty dedicated to show up. I am. They laugh. My kids laugh at me as well. They're like, Mom. I was like, You know what Mom is doing? <laughs> They're like, We're not bringing you your computer. I was like, Don't worry. You don't have to bring me my computer. I have a phone. <laughs> I don't usually like to share personal things about myself, but my wife had, was diagnosed with cancer last June, so I'm certainly well aware of how terrible and frightening yeah, Some days are better than others. You feel sick, and then you can put on a good smile. So my friends are like, you fight it out. I was like, you can't let it get the best of you. So even on my worst days, I'm still trying to find something to do. Right. So I was like, you guys, I get to go to class today. They're like, you're excited? I was like, yes. I even told the doctor, I was like, so you're going to have to step out of my room because I'm logging in. I was like, you better not tell my fiance, like, at <laughs> all. <laughs> um, well, let me go ahead and I'll, um, I'll mute, mute both of you. And um, then if you have any questions at the end, just let me know. Okay. All right. Let's uh, go ahead and start the week two live meeting for the introduction to paralegal studies course. And you notice right there the chapter heading, the, um, the authors have called this the inner workings of the law office. A very ominous uh, title. And um, the probably the, the most the simplest way I can describe it is the law practice is a business, just like any other business, whether it's an insurance company, a doctor's office, whatever. And so certain activities are pretty much standard in working in any office. And the law office maybe has some unique characteristics, but for the most part, you're, if you've, worked in any offices, they pretty much follow the same ideas. And so the, um, the law offices are no different. And again, we've mentioned the distinction between the smaller firms, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and, and the larger firms. But let's go ahead and first talk about the structure. And you notice there are four types of structures for law offices. Sole proprietorships, partnerships, limited liability, that should be limited liability partnership, and professional corporation. Again, all of these have a specific function and the organization depends on the members of the law firm, how they want to operate their business. Now, the first one, sole proprietorship, is by definition just one attorney. And the one attorney is operating on his own independently. Uh, he may have a 
paralegal working with him, he may have three or four staff people, depending on the kind of work that he or she does. So the sole proprietorship, the person is operating as on their own with without any other attorneys involved. Kind of the lone wolf idea. The partnership is just what it says, is two or more attorneys have decided to practice law together and they have formed a partnership where um, they're going to, the usual way to do it is they share in the profits of the business, but share in the expenses of the business as well. And they pretty much share management decisions, all of that. So I've been in many, many interesting partner meetings um, as a young attorney. And um, so they're going to, um, the, have we got somebody else on the line? Uh, yes, sir, Rebecca. Oh, hi, Rebecca. I'm going to go ahead. Yes, Good. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Now, the one disadvantage of the partnership is the liability in the event the partnership is sued, they incur some kind of liability, all of the partners are liable individually. So if you are operating in a partnership, then you are operating as a, really it's the same as a sole proprietorship. Your personal assets are gonna be liable for any debts, any liabilities that the partnership incurs and so many businesses not just attorneys form these last two kinds of entities and they're a little different in that the limited liability partnership is a way to operate still as a partnership but you have the protection of limited liability that if the liability partner the limited liability partnership is sued by someone the partners liability is only to the extent of what they have invested in the partnership they're protecting their personal assets well, from any kind of loss incurred by the limited liability partnership the last one the professional corporation usually large law firms are going to operate as a corporation and the professional corporation is just like any other corporation the they operate as with a board of directors the board of directors hires officers for the corporation and again the attorneys in the practice are stockholders in the professional corporation and again their personal assets are protected because of the structure of a corporation so the um, larger corporations are going to operate that way and again it, it doesn't matter on the size a um, a sole practitioner could incorporate with a professional corporation and have the protections that are afforded that Okay, let's talk a minute about law office management and personnel. And again, you can almost describe any type of office situation where some office, some law offices are gonna be operated very strictly. There's um, no chit chat or talking in the halls. And other law firms are gonna be a lot looser, uh, more, personal contact among employees. Again, it's just gonna depend on the style of the attorneys that, the, um, that you're working for. But there are some just basic duties that um, 
even para, the paralegal will have to do. Some firms may have a clerical person to do some of this. The larger firms are obviously going to have a large accounting department that handles the financial operations. The sole practitioner is the paralegals probably going to do most of the financial work and even the smaller partnerships and small law firms, it's going to be the same situation. Well, let's talk a minute about how attorneys get paid. And you notice we've got three types of fees on the um, slide. Fixed fees, hourly fees, contingency fees. The fixed fees are usually for the attorney doing a simple type of work for a client. The, uh, the preparation of a deed, the preparation of a will, the attorney will probably charge a fixed fee for any kind of, of a simple type of work that is going to involve a few hours of, um, of his or her time. So that the attorney would just charge the client a fixed fee for the work that's done. The, um, for the majority of attorneys, they are going to bill on an hourly fee. And the attorney is going to, we're going to mention in a minute, keep track of his or her hours, and the attorney will bill at an hourly rate for the work that he or she does. And the um, one advantage that paralegals offer, and of course this is part of the, the popularity and the use of paralegals now by attorneys, the paralegal's fee is going to be less than the attorney's. And so it's a way for the attorney, the law firm, to save money for the client. If the paralegal does work for the client, it's going to be at a lower hourly rate. And so in many cases, <clears throat> a law firm is going to use paralegals for a lot of the work involved in cases, and the attorney's only involved if maybe the client, they have to consult the client, there's any, of course, court procedures involved or just some supervision of the paralegal. This is probably the, the most popular way attorneys bill by the hour. The last type of fee, the contingency fee, is probably the most controversial because it usually involves the area of personal injury, the car accident cases. And these are the attorneys that you see every night on TV that promise to, if you're in an accident, call me. And if I will get you a large award for your injuries, the, the, all of us have heard these ads. There's, they're running all the time. And so there is some controversy among the public that, you know, whether this is a valid way for attorneys to make a living. The, the, the reason for it is the client, the injured party, is having to sue his or her insurance company. Well, the insurance company has attorneys working for them that they are paying to handle all of these claims. And if an individual ends up suing his insurance company, the insurance company is going to run the client, the injured party's attorney, around and around and run up hundreds of hours. The, there's no way many clients would be able to pay a fee like that by the hour. And so the contingency fee is the attorney gets a percentage of any award that he or she receives. 
And so that is the reason for the contingency fee. And generally, personal injury is the only type of lawsuit that a contingency fee can be used for. Other types of lawsuits, the, um, it's strictly prohibited. Now, let's talk a minute about ethics. And the attorney, the, believe it or not, the, the law practice probably has the strictest ethical standards, I would think, of any other profession. The, the attorneys are held to an ethical standard by the, they're regulated by state bars, you're, you're a member of a state bar where you practice law and the state bar has the authority over you to regulate your activities. You can be suspended by the bar for unethical conduct and you can be disbarred every month. Three or four attorneys are disbarred in Florida and for all kinds of nefarious activities. Sometimes they're criminal, but the, um, the bar has this authority over attorneys. So the, the attorneys are subject to the state regulations. The, the kind of standard ethical the, the ethical rules that most state jurisdictions follow are what were called the model rules of professional conduct. And you notice that they were passed in 1983. They are created by the American Bar Association. But these rules are only a suggestion to the individual state bars. State bars can still have rules that only their state follows. The model rules are kind of a general framework for, um, for any of the ethical rules. And you notice that it was passed in 1983. They, of course, can be amended and changed. But the model rules of professional conduct by the ABA, there is no, they have no authority over attorneys. They're more a model for, for the state bars to use. And here are some of the ethical standards that attorneys are held to. And again, as a paralegal, you're gonna be involved in this as well, that the attorney is held has a duty of competence. And what that means is if the attorney takes a case and the client hires the attorney to handle this case, the attorney knows what he's, he or she's doing in inv involved in that case, that they have the professional experience, they have the background to handle a particular case, that they are competent in that area. And so an attorney taking a case that he or she is not competent to handle would be a violation of the ethical rules and he or she could be subject to um, discipline by the state bar. The duty to supervise is obviously involving paralegals. The attorney is under an ethical standard to supervise all of the non-attorney's work in their office that they have to be in charge making decisions of any paralegal work that's done. And you would be surprised how many attorneys get in trouble for this, where they've allowed a non-lawyer to handle a matter, deal with the clients, and they end up being disciplined by the bar because they didn't supervise the non-attorneys in their office. So this does happen very frequently, the, um, the violation of that duty. 
the the next one obviously the the law practice involves very personal information that clients share with the attorney and believe me I've heard just about everything you um, you'd be amazed at how the, the personal information that the attorney in, uh, in, ends up discovering, either by the client telling them or by discovering as the case proceeds and the attorney is under a duty to keep client information confidential. And this, of course, applies to the paralegal as well. The paralegal is obligated and if the paralegal violates this duty of confidentiality, the attorney can be disciplined for the paralegal's conduct. So it is important that the paralegal understand that client information is confidential and that that has to be kept private. Along with this is really one of the foundations of the law practice and it's known as the attorney-client privilege. And this is probably as old as the attorney-client privilege is probably as old as, as attorneys have ever been. The idea is, and I kind of mentioned it before, the client, when he or she goes to the attorney, has to feel like anything they say to the attorney is confidential. And the attorney-client privilege benefits the client. And the attorney is not, re is not required to disclose any information that he or she discovered in conference with a client to anybody, third, any third parties, unless the client consents to it. That's the basis of the attorney-client privilege, that the client feels confident that whatever he or she has told you, it's going to be confidential. And I know I, I probably don't do it enough, but I really should uh, share some war stories once in a while. And the one that comes to mind just happened a year or so ago. I was representing a lady who was obtaining a divorce from her husband and um, they were settling all of the issues involving their financial situation and in the custody of their children and all of those. The confidential facts that I discovered was the husband was a clergyman. He was a minister with a local church and he was also gay. And he had been in a relationship with a partner and that was the basis for the divorce. And so there's just a simple example of where what what how much more private information can you have you can imagine an attorney a minister the coming out in the church the um the social stigma is still there we've come a long way with um gay rights but again this would be a very difficult situation if this information was disclosed publicly. So there's an example of where the attorney-client privilege is so important. Another important ethical requirement is the attorney has to avoid a conflict of interest. And when I explain it, it probably seems so simple, but there can be problems in the um, execution of that. And what we mean is you are representing someone in a, let's say a lawsuit, and it 
and you discover that you are suing the other the other party is a former client of yours and you have personal information about this former client you have a conflict of interest and you cannot continue to represent the client that you're representing because you have information that may benefit your client, the present client, against the former client. So, the um, and there are many ways that this arises, but again, the idea is you can't represent both parties to a in a in a lawsuit in a legal dispute that you have to have the you have to be free to make decisions without any conflict with the other party. Finally, the, the authors conclude the chapter. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've already discussed the details of the regulation of paralegals and that it at this point only the state of California, as I understand it, has a formal licensing of paralegals that is I mentioned many times the paralegals conduct is going to be subject to ethical rules of the attorney and so in a sense paralegals are regulated that way through the state bars there have been proposals I know in many states to maybe come up with a licensing requirement. And again, there's arguments pro and con on that, but um, the California, I believe, is the only state that actually has a licensing requirement to regulate paralegals. And the idea is, if you think about it, that if there was a state regulation, then some of the bad apples, we've got them everywhere, that they could be rooted out of the profession and um, and be subject to some kind of of um, discipline by um, by the individual states. So I'm going to conclude the meeting at this point and um, let me see if any of you have any questions. Anybody have a question? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. And who's the third one? No question? Are you asking about me, sir? Yes. Oh, uh, no, sir. Okay. All right. Will you, um, all of you have a good week? And um, let me know if I can help in any way. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.